Hey everyone, Professor Long here, your anatomy and physiology professor. Uh, doing uh, This is going to be our respiratory system video number one for those of you in my part two A&P class. Uh, quick reminder, you, I'm sure you already know, we're doing this because we're in lockdown from uh, the coronavirus uh, pandemic and we're going to be doing this for the rest of the semester. So you'll get some online quizzes uh, based on the sections of these videos and some worksheets. They'll be coming to Canvas when this after, uh, probably shortly after this video is posted. Um, I'm going to get the videos up. You can work through your note set. We're starting on the note set on page 69. I have my little note set handy here so I can keep track of things. Um, <clears throat> I'm working from home, as you all know. So if you hear any beeps or buzzes or kids or dogs in the background, uh, I may not stop a video and reshoot it. So just deal with it. Um, I'm trying to do it the best I can. Anyway, um, uh, once I get the video done, I will put some worksheets up that help you focus on which uh, words and definitions and concepts are important for quizzes. And I'm going to break this up in a series of videos so they're not all too long. Um, so anyway, uh, this first one is going to cover the basics of the, the, the big picture of the respiratory system. Um, I do believe that we have to start with the big picture and then get down to the microscopic level and then go back to the big picture. It's kind of like looking at the picture on the box uh, when you buy a puzzle to get an idea of the layout, then you look at all the individual pieces and you have an idea where they fit. So I'm going to start simple and get more complex. Uh, we're going to start with the functions of the respiratory system. I'm going to move out of your way. You don't want to see me anyway. Um, so our respiratory system has basically five, depending on which textbook you look at, five to seven main functions. Uh, the first one is pulmonary ventilation. Pulmonary ventilation is the movement of air to and from the gas exchange surface. The, the gas exchange surface is a structure that we call the alveoli of our lungs. And when we get all the way to the end of the passageway here, the alveoli are the little air sacs. I like to think of the lungs this way. Imagine if I took a, you know, the plastic shopping bags that you get when you go to the grocery store, uh, as controversial as those may be in some parts of the world. But <clears throat> if I took a whole bunch of those bags and I started to kind of stitch them together somehow, to where I can create a giant parachute with them, then that giant parachute might be what we would call um, a lobule of a lung, and it's made up of a bunch of smaller sacs. Each individual sac would be called an alveolus. If I took a whole bunch of those parachutes and put them together, um, the individual sacs would be alveoli, each bag would be an alveolar sac, and then <clears throat> a group of those, you know, a whole bunch of those, Alveolar sacs would represent a structure called a lobule. You'll see this in the, in the videos for the lab models. And then if I take several lobules and put those together, they make a lung. Uh, actually, several lobules would make a lobe of a lung, and then several lobes can make a lung, two or three. So we're going to go over this anatomy together shortly, but nonetheless, the exchange surface where gas is exchanged between the atmosphere and our bloodstream, the plasma of our blood, is the alveoli of the lungs. Pulmonary ventilation is simply the movement of air from the external environment, from the atmosphere, into the lungs to that gas exchange surface and back out. You might want to think of it as breathing, but you can ventilate a person who is not alive. If you take a person or an animal that has a similar um, breathing apparatus as humans, the lungs, and you compress the lungs, air will come out. And when you let go, it will bring air in. So it's not necessarily breathing, although breathing is a type of ventilation. Um, it's simply the movement of air to and from the um, gas exchange surface, which leads us to the second function, which it provides a very large surface area for gas exchange. So <clears throat> it is estimated that if you took every alveolus of the lung and flattened it out of each lung and flattened them all out, you would have a surface area roughly the equivalent of a two tennis court or of a tennis court, both sides of a tennis court. So imagine taking a flat piece of paper or something that size and crumbling it up, cutting it in half and crumbling it up so much that it would fit in the area of your thoracic cavity. So it's a very large surface area, and we accomplish that by having folds on top of folds on top of folds on top of folds, all the way from the lung to the lobes, to the lobules, to the alveolar sacs, to the alveoli, and even some of the structures within that. Um, it does protection, and in order to protect itself, it does a number of things. Um, one of them is secretions. We secrete mucus. Um, we have the nasal conchi and the nasal cavities that we talked about in lab, which can create turbulence. 
So, for example, you know, um, as we learned with the blood system, turbulence is a change in the direction of the flow of air or of a liquid. So if I have some air flowing in a specific direction and it encounters some object, that air will start to swirl around and hit other air particles and cause everything to swirl around. Um, so <clears throat> this green marker is not showing up very well, but as the air swirls around, it's going to come in contact with the walls. The walls of the nasal cavity and the respiratory passageway, the respiratory tree, are coated with mucus. So we secrete mucus. That mucus can stick to and bind up a lot of particulate matter. If you've ever taken your air conditioning filter out of your air conditioner, for those of you who aren't aware, if you live in a house or an apartment, your air conditioner has a filter. When you take it out, to me, it looks like someone sucked a whole herd of cats through your AC. All that dirt and dust and debris was swirling around in the air that you're breathing. If we did that, if we coated our lungs the same way that AC filter gets coated, our lungs, the airflow through the lungs would be decreased. It would be blocked, something we call emphysema. So um, we can't simply th take our lungs out, throw them away, and put new ones in. So Mother Nature has to create a way to protect the lungs. And one of them is to create the swirls and the eddies. Another way is to warm and humidify the air. Because blood absorbs um, heat so well from metabolism of the body, and because the lungs are so incredibly vascular, um, there's a lot of warmth in there. And as we inhale and exhale, the air gets warmed, especially if like on a cold day when you exhale, you see the mist. That's... Um, those particles, of those not particles, those droplets of water that form the mist are condensation of when warm air hits cool air. The air, will, the, the water uh, that is uh, in a gas state in warm air starts to slow down and coalesce and form little droplets and we can see our breath. So when we inhale, another a similar thing happens. We warm and humidify the air and the water particles can also trap um or the water molecules, the water droplets can attract a little particulate matter. So that, along with the mucus, will trap particulate matter. And there's a thing we're going to cover called the mucus escalator, and I'll, I'll put a representation of it out. So let me erase this rather briefly. Um, <coughs> if I look at the respiratory tree, the trachea, the bronchi, and then all the other branches off of that, the entire trachea, if I were to look at the lining, is a special type of cell, and the cells that were, would be sitting here would be crammed together very tightly, a lot of them, like this, and they have little cilia on the edge, the little membrane extensions, and the nuclei would be crammed in here, and some of them are crammed up near the top, some of them are crammed near the bottom, and so the tissue looks like it's stratified, like it's multiple layers, but it really is a simple epithelium. Well, we already have a simple columnar epithelium, and so since this looks like stratifications, but it's not, it's called pseudostratified ciliated columnar epithelium. Pseudostratified, the fake layers, ciliated because it has cilia. Now the mucus that coats our respiratory tract is resting on those cilia, and it turns out that the uh, cytoskeleton, uh, the microtubules in the um, in this inside the cell, can beat. And they're all pushing the mucus up the tract. We call that the mucus escalator, or some books call it the mucus elevator. And any particulate matter that's trapped in that mucus would be pushed up towards the opening of the tract. If it tickles your throat, you do the old, <clears throat> and you pull it up. And that ball of mucus you pull up, you can either swallow, as gross as that may sound to some of you, but it gets the dirt and debris out of the respiratory tract. Or we hack it out in a loogie. In the nasal passages, if it tickles, we sneeze and snot it out or our nose runs. And all of those running reactions and all of those coughing and the mucus escalator are protective measures. They require the secretion of mucus. And there are other secretions and some enzymes and some other things that can help out. We may go over those in greater detail. Another uh, function is phonation. A part of your respiratory tree at the very top of the trachea it's a little box called the voice box or larynx, and that's where your vocal cords are. And uh, as we speak, some muscle contractions move the vocal cords, creating vibrations of air, which make sound. And so your respiratory tract is responsible for phonation, making sounds, which we can then shape with our tongue and other movements and speak. And finally, there's the sensations. There's a sensory part of 
our respiratory tract. It's not just olfaction, which is the sense of smell, which it does do. Smell is done through part of the respiratory tract. Um, but we also have stretch and baroreceptors in the lung that can detect stretch and pressures so that we don't overinflate or over deflate the lungs. So those are the main functions of the respiratory tract. And everything we do from here on out in the series of videos is going to address how do we get air in and out. We're going to look at the muscles of the thoracic cavity that help do that. Um, we're going to look at the gas exchange surface. We're going to talk a little bit more about the mucus escalator, although not much. We're going to talk a little bit about phonation. Not really. We've already kind of covered it. And olfaction we've covered in great detail. <clears throat> although I will talk about the other sensory, the baroreceptors and the inflation and um, deflation reflexes. Um, you do need to list the structures in order that everything would pass through. Um, and really, if we list the structures of the upper and the lower respiratory tract in order, then we would be able to trace air and which structures it would pass. So URT stands for the upper respiratory tract. The upper respiratory tract starts at what we call the external nares. Nares with an E is plural, with an I is singular. We have two nares or nostrils. It goes through the nasal cavity. And then it goes through the internal nares. into a structure called the pharynx. The pharynx you can see on the models is sort of the upper part of the respiratory tract that extends from the internal nares all the way down to the larynx. And the pharynx is actually divided into three sections. So I'm going to put that in parentheses. There's an area called the nasopharynx, which is attached to the nasal cavity. Then there's the oropharynx, which has an opening to your mouth. We can breathe through our mouth as well. The net respiratory and digestive tracts share the pharynx in common. And the third part is called the laryngopharynx. And I'm not going to write the word pharynx on there because I'm running out of room. But the laryngopharynx is that part that's connected to the larynx or the voice box. And finally, the last structure would be the larynx. Some people say larynx, but it's larynx. The, from the external nares, you're from your nostrils all the way down to your voice box is the upper respiratory tract. So if someone have a, has an upper respiratory infection, the infection lies somewhere in one or more of these areas. Now, I'm going to erase this. You've got all these structures, and I'm going to put the lower respiratory tract. The lower respiratory tract picks up where the upper respiratory tract leaves off and goes through a number of structures. So LRT lower respiratory tract, is going to start at the trachea. The trachea is your windpipe. So once air passes through the larynx, it enters the trachea, and then it goes through what we call the primary. And in case you're not aware, a one with a little odd is the abbreviation for primary. The primary bronchi. Bronchus is singular. Bronchi would be plural, and you have two primary bronchi, one for each lung. From the primary bronchi, it goes into what we call the secondary bronchi. You can write the word secondary or put a two with a little ot up there. The secondary bronchi, we have one primary bronchus per lung, a right and a left primary bronchus. We have secondary bronchi for each lobe of the lung. The right lung has three lobes. The left lung only has two lobes. You'll learn that from the anatomy in lab. And so we have a total of five secondary bronchi, three on the right, two on the left, one for each lobe of lung. And then we go into what are called the tertiary. And I'm going to write this word out. It's a, it's a different word. A lot of people don't get to see it early on in their bio, biology career, but you'll see it eventually. The three with the prime is the word tertiary. It looks like tertiary, but it's pronounced tertiary. Tertiary is the third level. Then you have quaternary, pentanary, hexanary, septenary, octanary. If you learned all your um, <clears throat> Greek words for shapes, pentagon, hexagon, five, six, seven. So anyway, tertiary would be the, the third level of branching. So we have tertiary bronchi, and we have a whole bunch of tertiary bronchi. From the tertiary bronchi, it goes into little structures called bronchioles. So trachea, primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, and then bronchioles. Again, every time we branch, there's a greater number of structures. It's almost like looking at an upside-down tree. If you look at a tree with all its branches and branches and branches all the way out to the leaves, 
all the even the veins and the little leaves. Excuse me a second. All right, I apologize for the break, but I was cooking something. I was cooking my lunch, and um, I'm not going to start this video over and lose the first 15 minutes. But if you look at an upside-down tree, you're looking at the respiratory system. There's a lot of branching going on here. So anyway, every time it branches, there's a greater number of those structures. So we go from the tertiary bronchi to the bronchioles. After the bronchioles, the bronchioles branch into what are called terminal bronchioles. Bronchiole simply means little bronchi. If someone has bronchitis, they have inflammation of the bronchi. Tracheitis would be inflammation of the trachea due to some kind of irritation. If you have laryngitis, it's you know an, an irritation and inflammation of the larynx. If you have bronchiolitis, that's kind of bad because now it's getting deeper into your respiratory tract. Um, anyway, I'll come back to that in a minute. Oddly enough, you would think terminal would be the last branching, but it's not. After terminal is respiratory bronchioles. Respiratory bronchioles are almost the last branching. They're the last of the bronchioles. From respiratory bronchioles, we go into these structures called the alveolar duct. And then after alveolar ducts, we go into the alveoli. That is the end of the line. All of these structures, from the trachea to the primary bronchi, secondary bronchi, tertiary bronchi, bronchioles, terminal bronchioles, respiratory bronchioles, alveolar ducts, and alveoli, are the lower respiratory tract. The dangers of upper respiratory tract infections is if they're not treated or if your body doesn't overwhelm them, then they can move into the lower respiratory tract. One of the things that our body does anytime is there is some kind of inflammation or irritation is to hypersecrete fluids, like synovial fluid in the knee. Well, some of the fluids that we secrete into the respiratory tract would actually slide down into the lungs, causing a fluid buildup, which is what we call pneumonia. It's fluid on the lungs. Pneumonia can be caused for a number of reasons, or there are a number of causes. There are bacterial pneumonia, like Klebsiella pneumoniae, which is a very infectious bacteria. There are viral pneumonia, like the coronavirus creates um, pneumonia, as well as some others. You can get it from the flu. Um, and then there's Physical irritation, like smoke inhalation, people who uh, are stuck in fire sometimes develop a lot of pneumonia, a lot of fluid on the lungs. And then you can't get the air through, you can't breathe, and as you guys know, without oxygen, our cells can't make, can, can't, cannot convert glucose into ATP, and your cells shut down. So those are the structures of the lower respiratory tract. If you wanted to trace a drop of air from the outside world in, you would start with the external nares, go through the nasal cavity, internal nares, through the pharynx, it's three sections, and then the larynx, and then you would hit the lower respiratory tract and just continue. You just put all of those structures from the upper and lower respiratory tract in the order that I gave you, and that would trace a drop of air from the outside world into your lungs. If, you, if I asked you to trace a drop of air the opposite direction, then you would just list them backwards, okay? So <clears throat> finally, I'm going to talk a little bit of what's on the bottom of page 69 called the respiratory mucosa. I talked about this a little bit already, but one of the things, uh, or I mentioned parts of it, so I'm going to erase all of this. I'm going to talk to you about a common theme in the human body that you're going to see. If I have the outside world, and I'm going to go into the body from the outside world, the first layer I'm going to cross is going to be an epithelium. And in a lot of the tubes and a lot of parts of our body, if I stuck a needle through my arm, I would hit epithelium. And then I would hit some kind of connective tissue. Usually that connective tissue right underneath the epithelium is called the lamina propria. It's not everywhere in the body, but think of the epidermis and the dermis. Okay. And then after the connective tissue, there's usually some kind of muscle. Like in my arm, I would hit the muscles of my of the extensor muscles of my wrist. And then there's another connective tissue. In my arm, that would be bone. In the respiratory tract, if I were looking at the wall from the outside world, which would actually, we're, we're looking at a tube that's kind of folded up on the inside, and this area where I put the L is going to be the lumen. So if I stuck something from the outside world, in here is really the outside world as it runs through you, and I went in this direction, or in the opposite direction, 
I would pass through an epithelium, a connective tissue, a muscle, a connective tissue. There's going to be another layer of muscle. There's going to be a connective tissue, and there's going to be an epithelium. Okay? So most of the tubes in the body have these layers. Epithelium, connective, muscle, connective, muscle, connective, epithelium. And I'm going to talk about that. Not all the tubes, but we're going to talk about this, especially with the digestive tract. We're going to have a muscularis interna and a muscularis externa and all these connective tissue layers in between. Um, when we do this, if we're going from the outside world in, and this, again, this depends on which textbook you look at. Some textbooks only include these two layers. Some textbooks include all three layers. It's known as the mucosa. The mucosa is the epithelium, the mucus lining. This is a mucus cavity. Um, then the lamina propria. And if the book stops there, then the next layer can be called the muscularis mucosa. Some people think of it as an independent layer. Some books include it as all three layers of the mucosa. I learned it this way, although the textbook that we've adopted leaves this as its own layer. Nonetheless, I think of the mucosa as an epithelium, a connective tissue, and the upper layer of muscle. When we look at the respiratory mucosa, it's that. And the smooth muscle of the respiratory tract is going to allow it to constrict or dilate like a blood vessel so that we can control airflow into the lungs. Under sympathetic stimulation, I'm chugging along, I need more airflow, I need to dilate the respiratory tree. If I were in a big dirt or dust storm or breathing in some tree pollen, then my body would want to protect my lungs and constrict the airflow, constrict it, can, decreasing the size of the, the passageway so less air would get through. It would be harder to breathe, but we would protect the lungs from all of that. And so we could trap it with the mucus escalator and push it out. So the respiratory mucosa consists of the epithelium and a connective tissue layer. The epithelium is the pseudostratified ciliated columnar that we talked about, the connective tissue, the lamina propria, and then there's a muscularis mucosa, which can constrict and dilate. <clears throat> now, um, one of the things I wanted to mention is that in the um, upper respiratory tract, we have a lot more uh, mucus glands here, uh, um, secreting mucus into the lumen or the surface of the lumen for that um, mucus escalator. And when we start to get further down to the lower respiratory tract, we have a little bit more smooth muscle. Anyway, um, I think you guys uh, have a pretty good understanding of all of this. The very last thing I will mention, and then we need to wrap it up, is the respiratory membrane itself. Um, and actually, I'm going to come back to that in another video because we're going to talk about the exchange surface itself. But suffice it to say that the alveoli themselves are one of the thinnest membranes in the human body. They are a single squamous cell thick. The thinnest flattest cells, if I started to stick them next to each other and curve them around, they can form a little bubble of cells that we call an alveolus. And right up against that, there's really a modified basement membrane, almost no basement membrane at all, which is different than the basement membrane that we see in the skin and the, um, from the epidermis to the dermis, which we talked about in part one. And then right outside of that is a capillary. Now, since we just finished the whole um, test on the blood system, as you know, capillaries have the thinnest walls. Their walls are also a single squamous cell thick. So I actually have the thinnest membrane in the human body where I need gas exchange. The wall of the alveoli is a single squamous cell, and then I have the wall of the capillary right up against it, which is a single squamous cell. Because oxygen and carbon dioxide, the two dissolved gases that primarily affect us for respiration, since they are lipid soluble, then what that means is that oxygen and carbon dioxide can cross this membrane pretty easily. And they're going to move down concentration gradients. We're going to talk about that in the next few videos. So I hope that was helpful and informative. Um, I'll pick up where we left off in the next video. So again, this is the respiratory system video one for my part two class. I uh, hope you had some fun. hope you had as much fun as I did. And we'll pick up from there. And again, sorry about my timer going off, but I'm not redoing this video. Have a great day. See you in the next few videos.